um, we're, gonna, we're about to have God's word opened up by Pastor Brian. Pastor Brian and Pastor Bobby. Pastor Bobby, thanks for being here as well. They have uh, served faithfully the kingdom. Their little church started in Australia and is now impacting the world. A uh, hundred thousand people call Hillsong their home church. 100,000 people from New York with Pastor Carl leading all the way to L.A., all the way to Germany. I mean, all over the world they have campuses. Pastor Brian has been the author of 13 books. Uh, we today are championing his brand new book, Live, Love, and Lead. Can't wait for you to get a hold of it. We'll, we'll tell you at the end of the service how you can get that book. Hillsong's brand new album came out this week, so we want you to champion that. Yeah. Um, if you'll get your phones out in just a minute, not while Pastor Brian's preaching, but afterwards, you can, uh, you can just go directly text. Can we put that up, guys, real quick? You can directly text uh, Hillsong to a link, and you can go from there straight to the Amazon site where you can buy Pastor Brian's book. You can actually get that today here so you don't have to wait, or you can get the brand new Hillsong album as well. We've linked it for you through direct text, but um, have a seat real, real quick. I, I want us to, to watch an introduction for Pastor Brian. Uh, this introduction is actually from you, uh, Liberty students. And so, uh, one more time, just put your hands together for Pastor Brian and for Hillsong United. And um, let's watch this video together. What do you say to a man who thought called by God to start a church? And he wanted that church to honor God by creating their own music. And he answered that call by meeting in a school hall with 30 people literally on the other side of the world. And now each week, this little church has locations in 14 countries and five continents. It has an average global attendance approaching 100,000. And each week, their music is sung by over 50 million people in 60 different languages. What do you say to that man? Here at Liberty, we say thank you for following God's call. Thank you for never giving up. Thank you for being a great leader. For being a good pastor. For being a good husband. For your books. For sharing your wisdom. For staying true to your calling. Thank you, Pastor Brian. For coming here. Come on, why don't we give the Lord Jesus Christ a great ovation in this room? Come on. Jesus, a great ovation. <laughs> He's the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords. Father, we just thank you for your presence in this place. Lord, we thank you for the Holy Spirit. Lord, I thank you that every one of these young people are important to you. Father, I thank you that you have a purpose and you have a plan for every single life here. Lord, I speak, I pray into every young person here's God-given future. Lord, we believe in Jesus' name that you're leading them, Father, out upon the water, the great unknown. And Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <laughs> well, how nice it is to be here and to have some of our team at Hillsong Church. We've basically got three genres of praise and worship, young and free, uh, young and free, and that's kind of headed up by uh, Bobby's and my daughter, Laura. And then we've got Hillsong United, and many of you would know Hillsong United. They obviously uh, have had a huge impact. God's used them. And then we have Hillsong Worship, which is kind of the best of all the worship. And these guys are Hillsong wor Worship, so some, like Taya, from Hillsong United, and uh, others from Hillsong Church who are part of our worship. All right, I know you wanted to know all that. Fantastic. Now, I hope you can understand my accent. <laughs> you need to, because in heaven, everyone speaks like this. <laughs> the thing I get told most over here is that I sound like uh, Bruce the Shark from Finding Nemo. Anyone already thought that? <laughs> well, we've been here doing a tour with my book and with a new album called uh, uh, Open Heaven. And so we're really glad to be here. I want to talk to you about dreams. When you were 17, many of you may only be 17. So when you were 17 or at the age you are now, what do you dream about? Do you have a dream? 
And do you believe it's God's will for you to have a dream? Do you come from an environment where dreams were encouraged? Or perhaps do you come from an environment where dreams were discouraged, where you were told not to hope for too much? I'm a huge believer in what God can do with a dream, a dream inspired by Him, by the Holy Spirit. When I was a little boy, I dreamed. I dreamed of one day being a leader, a pastor, of one day even if God gave me opportunity to plant and build a church. But I can tell you honestly, at the age of 61, that God has not only exceeded my dream a little bit, but like it says in Ephesians chapter 3, He's done that exceeding, abundant, and above anything we could ever ask or think, according to His power that works in us. What do you dream of? What do you dream about? What do you aspire to? What do you hope for? Do you believe you got these God-breathed desires? What do you pray for when it comes to your life? I'm an absolute believer that you're on earth for a purpose, a God-given purpose. Genesis 37 tells us the story of perhaps the greatest dreamer in the Scriptures. His name obviously was Joseph. And in verse 2 it says, this is the history of Jacob, Joseph being, what, 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers, and the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his brothers, because he was the son of his old age. Also, he made him a tunic of many colors, a technicolor dream coat. But, but when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than his brothers, notice this, they hated him. His brothers hated him because he dared to dream and could not speak peaceably to him. Now Joseph had a dream and he told it to his brothers and they hated him even more. They hated him. Now it says they hated him even more. So he said to them, please hear this dream which I have dreamed. There we were binding sheaves in the field. Then behind my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And indeed your sheaves stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brothers said to him, shall you indeed reign over us? Or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Verse 9, then Joseph dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers and said, look, I have dreamed another dream. And this time the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars bowed down to me. So he told it to his father and his brothers, and his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Let me talk to you for a moment about the power of dreams. You know, the Scripture says, Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no vision, people perish. Another version says, where there's no vision, people dwell carelessly. Still another version, people cast off restraint. In the New Living Translation, it says, where there's no vision, the people run wild. Do you know why many young people lose their way? Because oftentimes, they were never ever encouraged to dream, to live their life with vision. And sadly, the reason some young people break out do their own thing, run wild, dwell carelessly. Sadly, God-given potential can perish is because of a lack of vision, a lack of dream. In the message translation, it says it like this, if people can't see what God is doing, they stumble all over themselves. But when they attend to what He reveals, they are most blessed. People stumble all over themselves because they've got no insight, no vision, no dream for the future. We don't know everything that's in front of us. When I was 17, I was heading into, into college myself, and to be honest, I had no real idea of what was in front of me, but I do tell you, I had a dream, and it was a dream that burned inside of me. 
And I'd encourage every single one of you to have that kind of God-given dream that burns deep down inside of you, because I've seen the power of it. But listen, first, your dream is going to threaten some people. You see, think about Joseph. The reality is his brothers hated him because he had favor on his life. And then when he started to dream, the Bible says they hated him even more. And then when he had another dream, the Bible says that he, they hated him even more. So they hated him, they hated him more, and then they hated him more than when they hated him more before. I guess they just didn't like him. Do you know, your dream will threaten some people. Because to be honest with you, oftentimes if someone dares to dream, there'll always be cynics, there'll be people who perhaps they compare you with a sense of purpose, a sense of direction, and with a dream, with perhaps their lack of purpose. So don't be surprised if you dare to dream, if not everybody likes your dream. And sadly, just like Joseph, it was the people closest to him who didn't like his dream. It was his own siblings, it was his own brothers. Do you know at times it's not people far away, people out on the edges of your life that get most threatened by your dream. Sometimes it's your own brothers and sisters, people close to you, again, because they have the sense that your life is going somewhere. And it's amazing how maybe the people you would expect to, t- to pat you on the back and encourage you are the ones who are the most threatened by your dream. Maybe it's people you've done life with, people you grew up with, people you went to church and a youth group with. Sometimes those are the people, but understand if you're going to carry a dream, not everybody is going to like you and not everybody is going to like your dream. Second thing about dreamers. The first is your dream will threaten some people, and the second thing is dreamers never stop dreaming. They keep dreaming new dreams. I mean, that's how it was for Joseph. He dreamed a dream, and in his dream, literally he saw fields and the crop were all bowing down as he was one single crop that stood upright. It was a dream of leadership. He saw people bowing down to him, and to be honest, his life looked nothing like that at the time he dreamed, but that's what he believed for. But then the Bible says he had another dream. He never stopped dreaming. This time, he dreamed that the sun, the moon, and the stars would bow down to him. So it was a huge dream that he had. I would encourage you not only to dream, but never stop dreaming in your life. I'm 61 years old, but I can't drive onto a campus like this without inspiring a dream inside of me. I can't see God doing incredible supernatural things like is happening here without it inspiring me to dream some more. I've always been a dreamer. I was the guy who kind of drifted off in class because I'd you know, go into my dream and think about the future and think about life and think about what I would love to do with life. It's kind of the way I'm wired. And I can tell you now, I passed out a church that God's used and it's global. And to be honest, as I said, it goes beyond what my wife and I could ever have imagined. We were thinking of a little church on the outskirts of Sydney in Australia. And our dream sometimes was just that someone would, that people would come next week. So I've learned that God will exceed our dreams. Never stop dreaming. I pray that you will be inspired to dream today and that throughout your life you will never stop dreaming. I remember 20 years ago when our church turned 10 years old. I remember sitting at my desk one day and I closed my eyes and I started to think about the church that I could see. And it wasn't the church that we led then. It was a young, sort of vibrant church, but... No one really knew who Hillsong was, but I remember just sitting at my desk, thinking, praying, and starting to write what we call the church that I see. It talked about buildings that struggled to contain the increase. It talked about a church where the city and nation could not ignore it. It talked about all sorts of other things that were just a dream. And today, by God's grace, if I look back at what was written on that page, which now is in the lobby of every place we have church. If I look at it now, it's more of a description of the church that we have. And that's why when we turned 30 years of age, just two years ago, I sat down again and I wrote the church that I now see. And it's bold, it's gregarious, it's out there, it's, uh, you know, it's scary, 
But I believe we should never stop dreaming. Your dream will threaten some people. Dreamers keep dreaming new dreams. And the third thing about dreams and dreamers is dreamers understand other dreamers. That's how it was for Joseph. I mean, he was ended up in prison, and when he was in prison, he was able to interpret the dreams of a butcher, a baker, and a candlestick maker, or something like that. And ultimately, he was led to the Pharaoh himself. He was able to interpret the Pharaoh's dream, and that's how Joseph came into that place of leadership that he had dreamed about. It was God-breathed. So, friends, I would encourage you in life, hang around other dreamers. Stay in an environment where dreams are encouraged. Stay in an environment, build the kind of relationships and friendships where you all have different dreams, but you encourage because someone who has no dream doesn't understand the world or the realm of a dreamer. And so that's often where discouragement will come. That's often where cynicism will come. That's often where those who would try to squash your dream would come from. But if you've got the kind of friends where iron sharpens iron, and you've got the kind of dreams that really attract other dreamers to you, uh, even as, as with pastors, you know, there are some pastors who have kind of got old and cynical and negative, and they've lost sight of their dream. The Bible says, young men shall see vision, old men dream dreams. I think when you get older, if you lose your dream, the moment an older person stops dreaming, they also lose their capacity to inspire vision in younger people. So that's why I never want to keep stop dreaming. All right, let me talk about a dreamer, what a dreamer will need. And what Joseph needed for his dream to become his destiny. And the first one is you're going to need the will to live. Why would you need the will to live? Well, because there'll be plenty of things that try to kill your dream. And maybe even like Joseph, some things that would try to kill you. I mean, for Joseph, every set of the way, his brothers tried to kill him when he was serving in Potiphar's house. Uh, slavery tried to kill his dream. And then accusation tried to kill his dream. Imprisonment tried to kill his dream. When he became the leader of all the land of Egypt, then famine tried to kill his dream. There were always things lining up trying to kill his dream. You need the will to live because discouragement might try to kill your, dis your dream, or distraction might try to kill your dream, or temptation might try to kill your dream. There are always things that the enemy would try to use to kill your dream. And I'll tell you why, because your dream is a threat. It's a threat to the kingdom of darkness because of its potential for the purposes of God. Your dream may, may look entirely different than my dream, but all I will say is don't be surprised if discouragement or disappointment or sometimes challenge comes along the way because of the power and the potential of your dream. So, your dream. You're going to need the will to live. Second thing Joseph needed was the will to succeed. And why did he need the will to succeed? Because God gave him a dream of success. God's not going to give you a dream of mediocrity. He's not going to give you a dream of failure. He's not going to give you a so-so type dream. He's going to give you an outrageous dream that can have an impact well beyond yourself and make a difference in your generation that impacts other people, helps other people, blesses other people. I believe God wants to give you a dream not just for you, but for the purpose of God in your life. So you're going to need the word to succeed because that's the kind of God, the, 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 the kind of God that we have and the kind of dream He inspires. Listen to it here. In Genesis chapter 41, verse 40 to 43, Pharaoh says, You shall be over my house, and all my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring off his hand and put it on Joseph's hand, and he clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck what I need. Open my shirt up a bit. Hairy chest, gold chain around my neck. It's cool. <laughs> Anyone out there? <laughs> and he had him ride in the second chariot, which he had, and they cried out before him, bow the knee. So, in other words, God gave him a dream of success. And ultimately, obviously, through interpreting dreams, he ended up being the leader under Pharaoh 
of the entire land of Egypt, and indeed people bowed down to him, and ultimately his own brothers did end up bowing down to him. You need the will to live, you need the will to succeed, and you need the will to serve, because basically you live to succeed, and you succeed to serve. Joseph needed the will to serve because that's what he ended up doing. He was serving his, his dad when he was out there with his brothers. He ended up serving in Potiphar's house when he was servant to Potiphar. He ended up serving in jail by interpreting the dreams of other dreamers. Ultimately, he ended up serving by helping and stewarding the land of Egypt in a time of huge famine and his wise choices and his wise decisions allowed him in a time of huge economic crisis of famine to pilot Egypt through it and ultimately be a blessing to the lands around. So think about that for a moment. You need the will to live, for your dream to live. You need the will to succeed. You need the will to serve. You know, most people have the will to live. It's, it's part of our human nature, the will to live. Fewer people have the will to succeed. And I'll tell you why fewer people have the will to succeed. Because to be honest with you, it's not going to come without a price. There's sacrifices that have to be made. A lot of people may look to someone and think, man, I would love to do what they do, or I'd love to have what they have. But oftentimes what they don't want, or don't even want to know about, is what has cost them, the price they've paid, the sacrifices they've made to be where they are. You're going to need the will to live because I'll tell you right now, succeeding, which is God's purpose for your life, however you define success, maybe we define it different than a secular society, but I will tell you this right now, success doesn't come without a price. And as soon as someone fails to remember that there's a price to pay, it's the day that their dream diminishes. So most have the will to live, fewer have the will to succeed, and even fewer have the will to serve, because we're so good at turning things back on ourselves. But if you have that will to live, and if you have the will to succeed, and if you have the will to serve, then I believe you can be part of the 1%, a once-in-a-generation type leader, the kind of leader that inspires others to be all God has called them to be. So don't underestimate the power of a dream when someone will count the cost and pay the price. And can I tell you this, the greatest friend you have when it comes to your dream becoming your destiny, is the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit's not just a force. He is God, the Holy Spirit. And why is the Holy Spirit the greatest friend we have in seeing our dream become destiny? Because, to be honest with you, that's the language the Holy Spirit speaks. The Scripture says about the Holy Spirit, He'll show you things to come. It's in John chapter 16, verse 13. In other words, His realm is the future. He will show you things to come. In Acts 2, verse 17, I already quoted it. It says, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. It says, your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. I think when someone loses their vision for the future, sadly, they'll always return to their past. And the moment anyone loses their dream, they fail to be able any longer to inspire vision in their sons and their daughters. And I'm talking not just about my natural sons and daughters, though I pray I've inspired vision in them. One of my sons, of course, is co-pastor at Hillsong New York City and heads up Hillsong United. Unfortunately, he couldn't be here today. But I'll tell you now that I've got to keep dreaming if I want to inspire a generation. If I want to stay connected and relevant to younger people, and I sure do, then I believe I need to understand the power of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will keep you future focused. How does the Holy Spirit help us to see our dream become our destiny? Well, I think, firstly, the Bible says the Holy Spirit will guide you. It's in John 16, verse 13. It says, however, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. For He will not speak on His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak and listen to it. He will tell you things to come. The Holy Spirit will tell you things to come. And the Scripture says He will guide you. 
I love the thought that the Holy Spirit has guided us. Often even when we're unconscious, unaware of it, the Holy Spirit's prodding you, guiding you, keeping you on course with your God-given purpose. And to me, that's an incredible encouragement to know that the person of the Holy Spirit is there as my guide, nudging me, guiding me, leading me on toward God's purposes for my life. You know, I love that thought, the Holy Spirit guiding us, because it's a little like what Jesus said. He said of an earthly father, his son asks him for bread, a father is not going to give him a stone. How much more will your heavenly father give good things to those who ask him? How do you know that this dream is not just a little girl's fairy tale, a little boy's dream? How do you know it's not just this big fantasy that you've built up yourself? Because the Holy Spirit will guide you, and He will guide you towards truth. He'll guide you towards God's purpose. He'll guide you towards God's Word for your life. Anyone believe me here? Give me a wave. Anyone believe me here? Just checking you right there. Fantastic. I like it here. I might stay. I'm going to become a freshman at the school. <laughs> I'm going to join the football team. I hear it needs a bit of help, so I'm going to join. I'm only telling you what I've heard. <laughs> that went down well. Hey, the Holy Spirit is our guide. How else does the Holy Spirit help us when it comes to <laughs> I'm not a school teacher, don't worry. Hey, how else does the Holy Spirit help us toward our God-given dream? Well, the Scripture says, literally, that the Holy Spirit helps us. And I love that. It's in John 16, verse 7. I'll read it to you. It says there about the Holy Spirit, and it's Jesus speaking. It says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage, Jesus said, that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you, but if I depart, I will send him to you. And you know, in the Amplified, it enlarges that word helper. It uses words like comforter, counselor, helper, advocate, intercessor, strengthener, standby. You know, there's a reason why the Holy Spirit helps us. Because I can tell you right now that sometimes being a dreamer is a lonely road. Not everybody understands the realm of a dreamer, because you're seeing things that perhaps they can't see. But I love that thought, that the Holy Spirit is there to help us. He's your comforter. Thinking about Abraham, he had a dream. God gave him a dream. It involved the stars of the sky and the vast sands of the desert. It was all about fruitfulness. And then one day he stood in such a lonely place on a mountain when his son was on an altar prepared to sacrifice the very vehicle that God was going to use to fulfill the dream that he would have <laughs> those come after him like the stars of the sky and the sand of the desert. He stood there in a lonely place. Dreaming sometimes means it's a lonely road, but we have a helper, a come alongside. I love that. The Scripture talks about him as our advocate. In other words, he's a spokesperson, speaking on your behalf, intercessor. That means he's praying for you. I love it. Stand by. Maybe you can see me, but if the Holy Spirit is anointing this message, then that part's not me. That's my standby. I love the power of the Holy Spirit. I love the fact the Holy Spirit guides you, He helps you when it comes to your God-given dream. And it goes on in verse 8 and says the Holy Spirit convicts us. John 16, 8 says, and when He has come, it's Jesus speaking again, He will convict the world of sin and righteousness and of judgment. In other words, He'll convict you of what's right and wrong. How do you stay on course with your God-given dream? How do you stay on course so that that dream does ultimately enable God to do exceeding, abundant, and above what you could ever ask or think? Well, the fact is, the Scripture says the Holy Spirit is convicting us of sin and righteousness and judgment. He convicts us of what is right and what's wrong. And I love that thought because there'll be plenty of things, as I've already spoken, that the enemy would love to use, 
like dis distraction, like discouragement, like losing sight of your dream. And it's when dreams are gone that potential perishes, that people start dwelling carelessly, they lose their way, people run wild. I love the thought that the Holy Spirit convicts us, that He'll keep us living our lives by conviction. Young people, I can tell you right now, along the way there will be temptations, there will be discouragement, there will be other choices that the enemy can make look awfully attractive. But if we live our lives by conviction, the conviction of the Holy Spirit, then the Holy Spirit will keep you on course with His purpose for your life. It's a sad thing that people get taken out. People get taken out because of things that perhaps at the time look more attractive than your God-given dream. But if we do live our lives letting the Holy Spirit guide us, letting the Holy Spirit help us, letting the Holy Spirit convict us, keep us on course, show us what is right and wrong, then there is no stopping what God is able to do in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Amen. You know, the Scripture even says the Holy Spirit improves us. Because I don't know about you, but I look at the things God puts in my heart, and I'm thinking, well, how could I ever do that? I mean, how could I, how could I, how could I build a global church? How could I build a global ministry? How could I head a Bible college with not as many as this, but a lot, a lot of students from all around the world? I mean, if I look at it in my own strength, but listen to this, because I think it's awesome. If you somehow feel inadequate when it comes to the dream that God's put in your heart. Well, it says in 1 Corinthians 14 verse 4, and it's talking about the experience of Acts chapter 2, and it says, he who speaks in a strange tongue edifies and improves himself. It talks about the Holy Spirit's capacity to improve us. And you know, I really believe that oftentimes for us to fulfill what God's given us, we can't do in our own strength. But we do have the Holy Spirit who can bring us up to speed, who can improve us, who can show us things not yet done, and He can show us things yet to come in Jesus' name. we got the Holy Spirit working on our side. I find that so encouraging to know that the Holy Spirit is leading me, is drawing me, is helping me, is bringing me up to speed, can cause me beyond my own capacity to lead according to His promise and His purpose. Let me tell you one other thing. I believe the Holy Spirit will keep you relevant so that you and your life will keep connecting to the world around and about you, so that your life, your dream will have a sense of relevance to the world around and about you. It's a sad thing if we have a dream, but it's totally disconnected from the real needs of people and really distracts us or disconnects us from God's purposes in our lives. But, you know, when in Acts chapter 2, the Scripture says people filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke other languages. They were languages people could understand. I think sometimes people interpret the Holy Spirit kind of making you weird. But I don't think the Holy Spirit makes you weird, I think He makes you relevant. Suddenly, the early church was speaking languages that people recognized, languages that people understood. One set of people who heard the things of God in their own language were the Cretans. Now you know what the Bible says? Later on in the New Testament about Cretans, it calls them evil beasts and lazy gluttons. And in case there's any doubt, the very next verse says this testimony is true. In other words, they really were evil beasts and lazy gluttons. But they could understand in their own language the marvelous works of God, the Bible says, the wonderful works of God. Not the negative, not the miserable, not the small thinking works of God, no, the marvelous, the wonderful things of God. And if we understand the presence of the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit can guide us, how He can help us, how He can convict us, how He can build us and improve us, and ultimately how He can keep our lives connected to the world around and about us so that our message doesn't isolate, but our message instead enables us to be the right people in the right place at the right time, because I've found when we've planted churches anywhere in the world, whether it's been in Paris or Stockholm and, or Copenhagen or in Germany or in Barcelona or in Spain or in New York, LA or anywhere else, every time, it's been through the right person at the right place at the right time. 
And that's exactly what the Holy Spirit can do for you. You can be the right person in the right place at the right time, and in that moment, God can do anything in and through you. What do you dream about? What do you dream about? What do you dream about? Excuse me for pointing. What do you dream about? What was your dream at 17 or 18 or 19? What are you dreaming right now? Because I've learned in life never to underestimate what God can do with someone who dares to dream. I'll finish with one story. There's a young guy in our church, and uh, he is very, 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 very uh, capable. Actually, he was a freak of an athlete, a professional rugby player, a rugby league player. That's the real man's game. That's what we play without helmets and pads. And <laughs> I've offended the football community twice now. And uh, he was a top, absolute top elite athlete. As a matter of fact, he was MVP twice in his mid-20s and uh, just last year. He was the MVP for the whole league of rugby, a very professional, very competitive league. And after the season, and just after he received his award for being the most valuable player, he made a huge announcement. And his huge announcement was that he was going to try out. He quit mid-contract, mid he quit playing rugby, he's going to try out for the NFL. And people laughed at his dream, and people thought he's got to be kidding. His background was that as a young guy, he had all this talent, but he has lost his way. He found himself in trouble, literally got shot at. He got shot at in a park, and fortunately it missed. Was, he wouldn't even be alive, but it absolutely brought him into realizing there's more to life. And then through another amazing experience where he ended up playing rugby uh, for Fiji, which was kind of his homeland, and the villages that he played with were so poor and so humble, and even their quarters where they stayed were so different than what he was used to as a professional athlete. But they were, had a humility about them. They'd get up and pray at 5 a.m. every morning, and it was compulsory. The whole team had to get up at 5 a.m. He was not a believer. He was angry about it. He was saying, this is stupid. It's got nothing to do with sport. But over the whole tournament, their humility it kind of spoke to him, and on top of being shot at, it's like God touched him, and he got radically born again. Well, the end result was he became part of our church for quite a number of years. And so suddenly now, he's coming over here. And I'll tell you right now that his dream threatened some people. His dream, in actual fact, he, some people wrote it off and said he has absolutely no chance, and including many on ESPN, who just said he has no chance. Second time he ever touched a football, and the first time he ever touched a football in a real game or a preseason game was this year. And in his first second touch as a running back, he ran 53 yards. So I guess people started to take notice. And then people said he has no chance of ever making the team. I have one, one guy on SP, ESPN said he, he plays like a soccer player. This is not soccer, it's football. But then he went and he made the first cut and he made the second cut and ultimately he made the final team for the 49ers, San Francisco 49ers. And <laughs> yeah, and now I've got some friends. But then I just lost other friends. And so now he's a part of the team. He's just finding his way and finding his feet. But I can tell you right now, he had an outrageous dream. It looked impossible. People didn't like it. I don't know where your dream lies. Maybe you are an athlete. Maybe. It's in some form of profession. Maybe it's helping people on a grand scale. Maybe for some here it is being a pastor, a leader, having a ministry. Maybe it's something so different that I'm not even thinking about it. All I would say is hold on to your dream. Don't allow life itself to knock it out of you. I believe in dreamers. I encourage young people to dream. I encourage you to see vision and not be afraid to see vision. And if it doesn't look too big for you, if it doesn't look impossible enough, then I say, dream bigger dreams. Dream bigger dreams. Dream bigger dreams. Dream bigger dreams. God's got a purpose for you. You're not on earth by chance. You're not an accident. You're here for the purpose of God. And Mo jo Joseph, he dreamed such a dream that it made people hate him. But I got to tell you, God 
God made his dream come true. And I am testimony myself that God can cause dreams to come true. So Father, again, I pray for every one of these students. Lord, thank God for them. Thank God that they're here for such a time as this. Lord, I pray even being at school will be more than just classes, more than just studying for whatever the profession, whatever the calling they have. But Lord, it'll be a time when the Holy Spirit deeply impacts them. When Father, they literally do see themselves coming up to speed and being improved, not just by academics, but Father, on top of the academics, by the Holy Spirit, Father, and the absolute work of God, the work of Christ in their hearts and in their lives. Lord, we claim it in Jesus' name. I'm going to ask everyone to stand. And we're going to sing this song one more time.